Good morning. It is good to see each of you here this beautiful Lord's Day. I know it's a little bit rainy outside, but can you just see how green everything's getting and all the flowers and everything blooming? So, so we may got some of your garden out this week and, and uh, we'll be pushing up out of the dirt real quick and stuff. But it is good to, to be in the house of the Lord together. This morning's memory verse was taken from Psalms chapter 68, verse 19. And so that's sort of the beginning point for our lesson this morning. So most scholars agree that this psalm was written in the context of them moving the Ark of the Covenant found in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And so the Ark of the Covenant has been moved. David's celebrating the move of the Ark of the Covenant. And so it represented so much to them. It was God's presence. It was God's protection for his people. And it was sort of kept the enemies sort of in check in some respects because this was a very special place in which God's sort of presence was known amongst the people. In fact, Obed-Edom, when the ark was at his house, is like everything good happened to this man. You know, he was blessed beyond measure, and they recognized that having God's ark present was very, very important. So the psalm includes a whole lot. It's not a very lengthy psalm. I'd like to read it to you. It's a historical psalm. It's also a psalm that tells a lot about how we should respond to God in prayer, in praise. And it's also a psalm that has this imprecation piece in it. It's a warning to the enemies. In fact, imprecatory prayers are ones you sort of ask God to sort of punish your enemies. And there's this part of this psalm as well. So if you'll indulge me just for a few moments, if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, you can open it up and you can sort of follow along with me. I'm going to be reading from the New King James translation. So it may read, parts of it may read a little bit different to you. And that's, we're going to talk a little bit about that in this morning's lesson. But Psalms chapter 68. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets a solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. O oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook, the heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. You, O oh God, sent a plentiful rain whereby you confirm your inheritance when it was weary. Your congregation dwelt in it. You, O oh God, provided for your goodness for the poor. The Lord gave his word. Great was the company of those who proclaimed it. King of armies flees, they flee. And she who remains at home divides the spoil. Though you lie down among the sheepfolds, you'll be like the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattered kings in it, It was white as the snow in Solomon. A mountain of God is the mountain of Bashan. A mountain of many peaks is the mountain of Bashan. Why do you fume with envy, the mountain of many peaks? This is the mountain which God desires to dwell in it. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. The chariot of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as he is in Sinai in this holy place. You have descended on high and you've led captivity captive. You've received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us up with benefits, the God of our salvation. Our God is the God of salvation and the God the Lord belongs escapes from death. But God will wound the head of his enemies, the hairy scalp of the one who still goes 
on in his trespasses. The Lord says, I will bring back from Bashan, I will bring them back from the depths of the sea, that your foot may crush them in blood, and the tongues of your dogs may they have a portion from your enemies. They have seen your possession, O God, the procession of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. The singers went before, the players of instruments followed after. Among them were the maids playing timbrels. Bless God in the congregation, the Lord from the fountain of Israel. There is little Benjamin, their leader, the princes of Judah and their company, and the princes of Zebulon, the princes of Naphtali. Your God has commanded your strength, O God, what you have done for us. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring presents to you. Rebuke the beast of the reeds and the herd of bulls with the calves of the peoples. To everyone submits himself to a piece of silver. Scatter the people who delight in war. Envoys will come out of Egypt. Ethiopia will quickly stretch out her hand to God. Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. I'll sing praises to the Lord. To him who rides on the heaven of heavens which were of old. Indeed, he sends out his voice, a mighty voice. The scribe's strength to God, his excellence over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. O God, you are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. You know, for thousands of years, when people professing to be following God would assemble, a good portion of the time that they were spent in assembly was simply hearing someone read from God's word. We know in the Gospels when Jesus came to his hometown, he read from the scrolls in the synagogue in Nazareth. And for thousands of years now, people have heard the Psalms read or sung. They've contemplated on them and found meaning and purpose. In our daily Bible reading, we've chosen a verse from every book in the Bible as we go through. We won't get through all of it, but we'll start back up again next year. And so it was really interesting sort of where the verse chosen from Psalms was taken. Because there's a lot of Psalms, maybe your favorite, the 23rd Psalm. We all know that one, the Lord is my shepherd. Maybe Psalms 1, about the godly man. Maybe Psalms 100, make a joyful shout to the Lord. Maybe you have a specific psalm that speaks to you. But this morning's verse was interesting. And it's one of these things I have never really specifically preached on this verse. But the more I spent time with it, the more I thought, man, this, this is pretty powerful. And I think it's a message that speaks to us this day. But I think it's something we can drive some meaning from. It was very interesting when I began looking at this psalm. It, it was also the psalm that... Paul links to the ascension of Jesus in in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. He actually quotes Psalm 68. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So when we're reading this, we don't make that association necessarily, thinking that it's sort of referencing who Jesus is and what he does. But Paul definitely made that connection. So when he writes this letter to this church at Ephesus and and that's scattered throughout all the Asian churches, eventually down to us today, he's connecting this psalm to something about what God is doing ultimately through Jesus. And so the New King James in Psalm 68 verse 1 read just a moment ago, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let those who hate him flee before him. Really, verse 1 of this chapter is saying, if you're not on God's side, take notice. He's telling people who are against God to pay very close attention to what God's fixing to do. You know, the reality is that no one that ever hardened their heart against God really prospered. God is the joy of his people. The psalmist is saying, let's rejoice in who God is, especially when we come before him. So you're going to have to use your imagination. The ark of God is being moved And there's a lot of pomp and circumstance put along with that. And this is a psalm to celebrate God's moving with his people and God being present with his people. And the warning of the nations around them who might wish them ill, the psalmist is saying, take notice. If you're an enemy of God and an enemy of his people, you're in trouble. And so he's really saying, pay attention to what God is doing. 
Psalm 68, verse 5 through 6. God is a father of the fathers, a defender of widows. Is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in the light, dry land. So the psalmist is really speaking of how God blesses people and how God recognizes the needs of everyone. Now, in the context of this time and day, there weren't social support mechanisms like we have today to take care of the fatherless, to take care of the widows. Very often, they're the marginalized. They were forgotten people. And the psalmist says, God does not forget these people. In fact, as I read this psalm, it reminded me of some of the stories that people shared with me about your connections to the people here at Netherland. And some of you shared with me that, you know, when I came here, I really didn't know anyone. But now that I'm part of things here, this is like my family. I didn't have a lot of other folks in my life that really felt close to. So the psalmist is saying that God has this ability somehow to take people who could be very easily disenfranchised or people who be very easily forgotten and make them matter. Either his provision, his care for them, how he protects them, how he provides for them, but God can do this. God delights in mercy. He does. God loves to get mercy. Now, on our human experience, sometimes we don't want to give mercy to people because we feel like they need to suffer. You know, maybe someone said something to hurt your feelings or maybe when someone said something that made you feel bad and they're begging your forgiveness and you sort of want to withhold that forgiveness but start to suffer just a little bit more. God's not that way. God delights in giving mercy. He cares for the afflicted and the oppressed. He makes people belong to his family. Now, maybe that's why Paul thought about in Ephesians when he's writing about how we're sort of brought together by God. And we read this this morning in our Bible study class about how through Jesus, he took down the wall of separation and made us all one in Christ Jesus. Maybe Paul was reflecting on Psalm 68 as he wrote to the church of Ephesus. Maybe he had even the scroll open in front of him, but he made a connection to how God is doing something important. And trying to bring this all together. Perhaps one of the most toxic things we have in our culture today. That really adversely affects people. Is loneliness. I know ironically we seem to be the most connected of people. Because we have all this technology at our disposal. We can Snapchat. We can Instagram. We can text. We can Twitter. We can Facebook. FaceTime. We can email. But the irony of that is, is that in spite of all this, people still feel very, very lonely. Feel very, very lonely. To the point that it can be toxic in people's lives. In my work on suicide research that I do, we recognize one of the most toxic things that puts people at suicide risk is this thing called thwarted belongingness. Just not feeling like they belong to anybody in a meaningful way. And the psalmist says that, you know, people matter to God. People who may not matter to anyone else matter to God. And he has a way of making this part of a family, making us have a place to belong. This is the part I alluded to earlier that I found very interesting, particularly with today's memory verse. Because I found no less than three, possibly four or five different translations of this same verse that emphasizes different things. And they're unique in and to themselves. So when Bible translators are looking, especially at ancient texts, they're trying to understand the context of it. The Hebrew text is pretty simple in many respects because they don't have a very, very large vocabulary. But you had to sort of understand what words meant in context. And the Hebrew went from Hebrew into to Greek. And, and Greek has a bigger vocabulary, but still somewhat limited. For the word, for example, there's a Greek word, psyche which literally can mean butterfly. And literally the word can mean butterfly. But also the Greek word psyche is used a lot in the Bible. And it's not talking about butterflies, but it's talking about the soul. So Jesus used the word psyche when he refers to the human soul of man. So you have to understand that words in context have different shades of meaning. And so sometimes translators have to make a tough decision. And sometimes it does change and shade the meaning of things. So this morning's, our memory verse was what? Church? Yeah. 
doesn't that just feel good to you? Praising God because he daily bears our burdens. I don't know when you woke up this morning, your first conscious thought was feeling burdened. But if it was, isn't it a great comfort to think that God daily bears our burdens? It's a great comfortable thought. In fact, this is a very powerful, powerful thought. So the NIV on this passage expresses that it's something about God bearing our burdens. And it's very consistent what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 29. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Boy, that just sounds just like what he talks about here, doesn't it? You know, let me bear your daily burdens. I mean, and that's great comfort we have. Jesus himself saying to us as his followers that, you know, just come to me. I will give you rest. You'll find, and my burdens are not heavy. And that brings us great comfort. So in the context of what he describes in Psalm 68, yes, it sounds like, yes, this is about God who's the burden bearer for his people. He champions them. He protects them. He does these amazing things for them. But yet, when we look at other translations, the contemporary English version emphasizes from the same verse, it's more about God's rescue. In fact, the contemporary English version, we praise you, Lord God, you treat us with kindness day after day, and you rescue us. I don't know when's the last time you had to be rescued. To be on the receiving end, that feels pretty good. Even if it's something minor, like you broke down somewhere and you get hold of a friend and they show up, it feels good. I've never really been stuck in a bad physical situation, but think about being lost in a cave like some people seem to be doing a lot here lately. The poor fellow from England that got over in Jackson County in Flins Lick area and he got lost in a cave. And someone from Florida had to come up and rescue him. How good that must have felt when he saw the light coming into the darkness. Like, okay, I'm rescued. But spiritually, we've all needed rescuing, haven't we? Spiritually speaking, we've been lost. We've been in darkness. And Jesus came in and rescued us. So we look at what God has done time and time again to his people. And they're celebrating this day. It's a processional. It's a parade for God, if you will. And they've got the ark and the priests are bearing it. And they're celebrating the moving of God's presence amongst them. But we as Christians know what the Hebrew writer says about Jesus. The commentary about him. It says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. In the darkest moment of your life, when you felt like no one else loved you, when you felt like no one else cared, I guarantee you, Jesus was there. His spirit was upon you. And he sustained you. And you may be sitting here this morning because he did. And you knew that. But the New King James translation takes even another emphasis in the same verse. I read it earlier. But the emphasis in New King James translation is about how God blesses us. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits that the God of our salvation. Now, you'll see that some of those words are italicized there, you know, and basically what that's telling you, this this is a hard verse to interpret because when they put italicized words, they say, we don't have an equivalent word in the original language, but we're making our best guess. Okay. So they're saying here that this perspective on it is because David's talking about all these things that God is, that God loads us up with benefits. And I think that we can dispositionally train ourselves to see those more clearly. I think sometimes those things are really easy to take for granted. We assemble here this morning in pretty good assurance that we have peace, right? No one got scared on their way to church this morning. You weren't suspiciously looking around you this morning. Who is that stranger? Who's this person? Because we are blessed to be able to come do this today. You know, we have brothers and sisters Christians around the world who don't have that same liberty, don't have that same freedom. I've been told about the house churches in China at one time were so oppressed when they assembled 
on Sundays to worship God? They sang. So the government officials wouldn't find out about them. Can you imagine what that'd be like? Several of us went several years ago up to Free Hills Church of Christ to a gospel meeting. We were invited to go and we went up there. And Free Hills, most of you are familiar with it, Clay County, a traditional African-American community, a lot of history up there. And we went up there and Clay County has this thing. Okay, I think when Clay County, whoever unlocks the building and starts singing, everybody just starts joining when they get there. Because they sing, they start singing about 30 minutes before the service starts. If you're going to start at 7, you start singing at 6.30. Okay, that's just Clay County. I mean, that's just one of the unique things about them. Love them for that and stuff. But so we got there early, like to sing, and it was really, really a good experience and stuff. But they called upon one of the brothers there at church. And if he was 90, he was 90. I tell you, he, he was a very old, old, old black gentleman. Like brother. And when it came time for him to lead prayer, he got down on his knees, arthritic knees, and he said the very first thing, Dear Lord, I thank you that I woke up in the land of the living. And he went on and prayed God into the room that day. And my sons were with me, and they said, Dad, did you hear him pray? And I said, Yeah. And they said, it's like God was there. And I said, Yeah. But he was a man who knew that the Lord loaded him with benefits. And he took the most routine, mundane thing you can think of to wake up and thank God for. I think some of us, instead of counting our aches and pains, we'd be a whole lot better off to count our benefits and blessings. Amen? I think that's a challenge for many of us. But what we see happening is that even in this one verse, even in this limited vocabulary for our English words, that there's different ways of looking at God from different perspectives. And every one of them is true. Every one of them is true. So that King James considers what blesses us. Again, the more I begin looking at this Psalm 68, and of course we're studying Ephesians, and studying Ephesians, I'm thinking, man, Paul was inspired by this psalm to say a lot to what he's saying to the church at Ephesus. In fact, we read this a few weeks ago in Bible study class. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then the ages of the coming might show the exceeding richness of his grace and the kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God is good. And he's good to his people. And Paul says he's raised us up. It's like the fatherless and the widows and the people who don't have family, the solitary people. He's made us to sit together in heavenly places. He's made us significant. He says we belong. And so I don't know what your perspective on God is this morning. I don't even think that these three would even completely describe everyone's perspective on God this morning. Each one of us here has some perspective on God. And that's why he collectively says, come together, come together. Encourage each other. Stir up love against works. Praise me. Experience the presence. Brother Herb made the point this morning that when we're here, God is here with us. The Spirit of God dwells with us in this place. But this morning, is God the God who bears your burdens? Is He the God that rescues you? And sometimes it's amazing that God needs to rescue us from us. Some people are their own worst enemies. I had the, the local TV stations doing a documentary on drug abuse. And they interviewed me this week. And they said, what do you think addiction is? And I said, so you want the textbook definition or you want what I think it is? So what I think addiction is is the maladaptive coping that becomes systemic. People choosing a substance or a behavior to cope with things that's a not really a good way of di- coping. And it becomes systemic, either physiologically they get hooked on it or psychologically they hooked on it. Regardless, it becomes a problem. And the irony of it is what we know about addiction is the only thing that helps overcome addiction is turning your life and will over to your higher power. But is he the God that rescues you? Or is he the God that blesses you richly? Do you look on your life and you look around and you see how you're blessed and you think, man, God has been so, so good to me. So so good to me. Psalm 68 is about God's presence in the life of his people. 
to provide, to protect, and to place them. But here's the situation with God. He does not force himself upon you. He doesn't. You have to accept him. You have to make a decision. Now, we build a lot of we build a lot of emotional energy up around this point in the sermon and you know, sort of, you know, trying to encourage people to make a decision. But the truth is it's open. It's something that we do. The opportunity to respond to God is open all the time. Anytime. But it's an important thing to do. It's critically important. It was a Sunday morning fifty six years ago today that I was born. Today's my birthday. And I was birthday I was born on a Sunday morning. So I don't know what that there used to be old saying about Sunday's children or something like that. So I can't remember what Sundays were, by the way. But the truth of the matter is, is that was just one of my birthdays. I was born a second time when I was baptized. And the first birthday was good because it was a, made it the marked time of how much time I spend here. But the second birthday was the most important one. Because that's when I laid claim to all of God's promises. All that he said in Psalm 68, all we've talked about this morning about blessing and protecting and rescuing is the same thing that's available to all of us. So if you're here today and you just like to ironically share my birthday, that'd be a good thing. We've got a song that Adam's chosen for us. We're going to sing it right now. If we could sing it uh, and, and you can respond, we'd love to assist you at this time.